Welcome back, Left Reckoners. Just David here, um, but very excited to be joined by a good friend um, and frequent guest of this show and also TMBS alumni, Gene Bajlon. Uh, Gene Bajlon is the associate, uh, the managing edi- editor, excuse me, of uh, Sublation Magazine and an associate uh, professor of middle of the history of the Middle East at Missouri State University. Thanks so much, Gene, for spending some time with us today. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. It's always a pleasure to be here with you, David. Well, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the new project um, at Sublation because I think it's filling an interesting hole in the U.S. left. But before we get there, um, I know this is a broad question, so take it you know, however uh, you'd like. But I think it, it might be useful to sort of get your perspective on the state of you know, the American left and also maybe a little bit the general like English-speaking world uh, left right now. Where are you f- finding that we are, what you're finding that we're missing and maybe what you're finding may be a little bit inspiring or looking forward to. Sure. So, you know, I should probably begin by saying, and I think this is pretty important to highlight, that I don't have any specific answers for anything. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I'm as lost as everybody else when it comes down to uh, the path forward. And, you know, obviously my positions vacillate at times depending on, you know, uh, events around me. Uh, but broadly speaking, I would say that we're going into a phase of contraction and defeat. Mm -hmm. And that is going to be a very stressful thing for at least the left in the English speaking world. There are different dynamics in France and other parts of Europe, but in Britain and the United States, we're going into a phase of sort of decline, defeat and contraction Mm -hmm. uh, for a number of different reasons. You know, if you speak to some of the sort of sectarian leftists out there, they'll say, well, we always deluded ourselves about whether the left was on the rise. In reality, it was not. It was always going to be diverted into mainstream capitalist politics. But I think for your average, let's say, normie lefty, up until 2000, or in Britain a little bit earlier, there was a kind of positive political project that people could rally behind, Mm -hmm. which in one hand, gave people experience, gave people some sense of optimism, uh, but on the other hand, obfuscated serious divisions between elements of the left on what their programmatic desires were, what their vision for political power was. So in in the United States, obviously, there was the Sanders run in 2016, and then then basically from 2016 to 2020, Mm -hmm. we were waiting for another Sanders run. Right. Mm -hmm. And we're moving towards that second Sanders one. And then, of course, in Britain, you have Corbynism and the rise of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership of the Labour Party. And then obviously his electoral defeat and his ultimate you know, removal from the leadership of the Labour Party, Mm -hmm. you know, in 2019, 2020, uh, just before COVID hit. So we have uh, the mainstream kind of left populist drive that dominated the 20, second half of the 2010s, that kind of crashed mm-hmm. and burned. And so I think a lot of people got burned out. A lot of people have returned back to, you know, more traditional liberal politics. I think the Ukraine war, for example, mm-hmm. I think accelerated the divisions in terms of splitting who were the left liberals and who were the socialists mm-hmm. from one another. Totally. And so I think we, 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 we're coming into a period where nobody really has any clear path forward, at least in the same way as we had before. And I'll give an example of this. You know, uh, my good friend, C. Derek Vaughan, I asked him to write an article uh, for sublation uh, because I'd spoken to him. And I said, well, you know, why don't you write an article? And what had we spoken about? Well, Jacobin were... Uh, there was an article in Jacobin calling for another Bernie Sanders run. Mm-hmm. And with all due respect to the author and to Jacobin magazine, I think that is a sign of we're out of ideas. If if our like game plan for 2024 is we'll we'll run a like 82-year-old Bernie Sanders, then we have serious problems. And all the arguments um that people put forward. Um, 
to say that we should run uh, Bernie Sanders, for example, well, who else would you run? Uh, they all expose the fundamental weaknesses of our movement, because if we're placing our hopes in an 82-year-old man, I think we need to be thinking about what exactly the direction of our movement is. Uh, on the flip side, I think, although it can be exaggerated, I think some there are, is some evidence that there is increased labor militancy, at mm -hmm. least in some places. I think that can be overstated because, of course, this comes on, on the heels of a heavy blow for organized labor. But I think we have seen some militancy in Britain. We're having a railway strike and the railway workers are very you know, powerful. Uh, but I do think you know people are beginning to think that, oh, maybe instead of engaging in left populist electoral politics, perhaps we should be engaging in, you know, union organizing and, mm -hmm. and, and building that kind of power. I think that might be a positive step or a positive direction. But I think in general, everybody, including myself, is confused. Because when someone says to me, well, what else could we do other than uh, run Bernie Sanders? It's like, well, you know, I don't really know, to be honest. Like, but I just don't think Bernie, running Bernie Sanders is necessarily a great idea. Well, I mean, I'm curious what you think about this because we've done some stuff on on 24. We had Ben on, and you know, my position I think is a little bit in between, in the sense that like burning 24, I'm getting my shirt out of the closet and knocking on doors and telling everybody to do it again. Um, just if like if that's what we're doing, like I'm all about you know going going another round. But I do think that um, one of the the issues here, and it's not even just about Bernie's particular viability, right? It's that because in the U.S. left, so much of the mobilization and recruitment that happened was around the context of a presidential campaign. I think that that sort of um, has created like a, a strategic deficit, I think, in the way that a lot of people in the U.S. left, at least, like think about politics, right? Where like, you know, power and victory is ultimately having the presidential candidate who's you know, maybe one day even comes into office where even Bernie Sanders himself was always making this argument that like, you know, if I come into power, we're going to need to have serious left mobilization out on the streets and in, in, you know, in Congress and local level, all that kind of stuff. Like we have to be able to build a movement to be able to force these things through because, you know, the, the, the presidency is a very powerful office, but as we've seen, like it, there actually are a lot of structural limitations on it. And I think that there's been a lack of theory, like theorizing and understanding of, amongst like the general membership of like the U S left, at least um, about what it actually would take to implement the things that we want. Right. And I think that like the fixation on the presidency itself, um, you know, sort of reveals like a lack of, of, of thinking um, on, on that question. I think it's, I think, yes, I, I, I agree with all those points, but I think also there is, it's not simply that, running Bernie Sanders would be a harmless, ineffectual, you know, gesture. My fear is twofold. Firstly, given the fact that it's highly likely it would be a third unsuccessful try, it would be a, a demoralizer. Yeah. It would be demoralizing. And I think a lot of people would be, a, it could lead to more cynicism. Uh, it perpetuates a reliance on Bernie Sanders when we actually need to be not, relying on Bernie Sanders. And uh, thirdly, you know, people have limited bandwidth. One of the strongest arguments, Adolf Reed made this ar argument, is that, look, the point is, like, Sanders may not win, but it's going to boot kickstart organizing, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think it, it's going to, you know, spread the word of socialism. It's going to, like, build up our forces. And I think there, especially in 2016, I think there was a strong argument for this. But we've seen since 2020, Sanders has, you know, been incorporated into the Democratic Party, which is now extremely unpopular. Uh, and he's not in the same outsider position that he once was. Mm. And this isn't really even a criticism of Bernie Sanders. I think, like, he did what he had to do, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the, or at least he did what was logical for him to do in his position to try and, you know, do some good from the, you know, chairman of the budget committee uh, uh, position. So in a certain way, he's kind of compromised with the, the unpopularity of the Democratic Party as well. 
and it would be better perhaps for the left to run a young un you know if we're talking electoral politics a young candidate who we may know is definitely going to lose but who can run several times mm -hmm. in, in the future if we think if we believe that these election campaigns are the right time to organize another argument could be maybe we need to reassess our strategy in this entirety and where we need to be deploying our limited time and energy so like and another thing just sticking to the presidential thing as as a pro here i mean again like i i, I don't mean to sound cowardly but i do have this sort of in-between position where it's just like fine if we all know what we're getting into right um but one thing that does worry me for example of a bernie absence and a candidate like you're talking about um is who is going to try to pick up this mantle and i think this gets to another big problem in the u.s left right now um, which is that you know there has been a lot of working out on the difference between a progressive and socialist politics and i think that a lot of the growing pains and stuff that we're seeing right now come out of that and i mean I, i'm very worried for example of like somebody who i think is very dangerous like a rokana um, coming in and trying to pick up the mantle of, of the Bernie movement in, you know, a 2024 moment or a Jaya Paul, right? Who I just think, you know, yeah, you know, they support Medicare for all, but who knows how deep, you know, that feeling even goes in the first place. And two, they don't have a sustained criticism of, of capitalism as, as a system. They're going back to that. We need to go back to, you know, fair capitalism, progressive capitalism, which I think is a very dangerous um, way for all of this energy and mobilization that we've seen as limited as it is. Like that's a, you know, you're walking off of a cliff at that point that that growth will stagnate really quickly. Um, so if Bernie d gets in if effectively just to block a coalescing of some of, of the the people who are sort of in the middle between like socialism and like that kind of progressivism, if he can block them going that that way, I think that that would be helpful. But again, I mean. I think that the, at the end of the day, one of the points um, that we make on the show a lot is uh, moving from a politics that's class focused to class rooted. Mm -hmm. And, you know, borrowing the term from Leo Panitch and um, and Gindin, right, that like right now you have a left in this country that I, I think sometimes people overstate um, the kind of. I don't know, PMC character of a lot of the left socialist movements. I don't think that that's not there, but I think that people really fixate on it because lefties love to, you know, put themselves up on the wall and, you know, apologize for, <laughs> for what they're doing in them for themselves. Um, but uh, yeah, I think that like, we really need to be focusing on like rooting ourselves in a class versus just a movement that's like, Oh, we're going to talk uh, about workers. Right. Um, it needs to be of them. Well, I, I, well, I think I want to pick up on something you said, which I think is really mm -hmm. important, uh, which is about this overemphasis on the PMC inverted commas characteristic of the uh, uh, left. I think certainly disproportionately you have credentialed people in the left, people with university credentials. But we've seen a mass proletarianization yeah. of university graduates to a certain degree, uh, to, a, to a large degree. Mm -hmm. And credentials and uh, education levels does not necessarily sync up with one's relationship to the means of production no. or to income levels. And I think one of the, uh, I would say, one of the problematic <laughs> aspects of a term like PMC, which does come out, you know, uh, Barbara Aaron Reich with the, mm -hmm. you know, comes out of someone from the socialist tradition is that it tries to, it, it, it leads to a confusion between a cultural category mm -hmm. and a social class, uh, uh, a question of social class. So I think, yes, probably you can make the case that people on the socialist left are credentialed, but that does not necessarily mean that they aren't working class in an objective uh, Marxian sense of, mm -hmm. of the term. Uh, uh, and we need to avoid falling into the narrative that the fundamental division in American society is between those with a university de degree and those without a mm -hmm. university degree when it's between labor and capital.
and like even like there was a moment in American history like where maybe that could sort of be used as a pretty decent place as a proxy, maybe yeah. like the nineteen seventies or something. But yeah, as you've seen more and more, like the the movement of like my generation in particular, like into the university, um, has been a sort of don't get uh, confused by the tone of my language, but like uh, <laughs> uh, a um. It's 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 cheapened like the the value of the bachelor's degree at least right where like and I think that that was actually quite purposeful right it was just like put this generation through the school system and I don't know maybe a little a little bit of a liberal hope that like the <laughs> the connection between wealth and the the degrees had to do something more with uh, um, you know oh these people are just smarter versus the, the way that capitals were situated um, in 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 this country. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a weird moment because I, I totally agree with like the fracturing and the contraction um, as, as a way to describe the moment that we're in. But I also have seen people become a lot sharper just in the sense that like, you know, early Bernie Sanders DSA versus like DSA today. I think a lot of the kind of importation into of like liberal identity politics and things like that, that were a little bit more dominant in DSA politics in the early, early days post Bernie. Um, a lot of those have been challenged. So I do think that people are a little bit are a lot more, frankly, um, strategic within those movements right now. But that has also come at, um, you know, a, a bit of a of a of a cost when it comes to membership and sort of sitting here, um, you know, with with the growth that we're seeing with that organization not being as high as we would like it to be. But all that being said, I, I always want to remind folks that, you know, a lot of times when people were talking about the DSA and elected officials, they're thinking about people like Bowman and AOC and are forgetting that, you know, there has been pretty exciting success of getting DSA candidates into political office that has mattered. Right. So like the DSA candidates in New York um, and I, I really do like this, this slate that's running right now um, for New York State. Uh, legislature there. Um, but even people like Julia Salazar, um, you know, she's done a lot of good um, for working class people in New York with the limited capacity that that she's had. And now she's been joined by more folks. So I just always do want to remind folks, because sometimes those stories don't really capture people's imaginations or attention as much as like, yeah, because oh, did AOC say something silly about this or that. Um, but like I'm saying, like, it's not all been negative in the sense that, oh, de decline, right? There's actually mm -hmm. has been an increase in people in those kind of smaller, more localized offices mm -hmm. who are delivering. Um, and it's not saying it's absolutely perfect right now, but like these are some things that we're seeing that it's not all just like one steep decline from, you know, the Bernie defeats in these primaries. Um, there actually has been a commitment in some areas and, and victories as well. And I do think, I think, uh, well, this is one of the arguments I would say against having a bernie run is that i think that people are a lot sharper than they were i think people may have come to political consciousness during the obama campaign in 08 or in 2012 they may have been hopeful for obama mm -hmm. uh, but i think the left has become sharper as you say mm -hmm. and i don't think that platitudes from a rokana or from a uh, Kamala Jayapal are going to be easy as you know, it's not going to be as easy for them as they might think it is mm -hmm. for them to take a, 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 a Sanders mantle uh, and just automatically rally the left behind them. And mm -hmm. I think we need to throw off the Bernie training wheels and we need to move beyond what that movement was. I'm not one of those people who's just like. Oh, it was all just a mirage. It was a all trick, pointless. Yeah. It was all it was all bollocks. It was all a waste of time. I think, given how defeated the left was, uh, I think the revival of socialism as something to be discussed, even if in a debased form, that you mm -hmm. might think is like, which is, is people basically just call it for Medicare for all and free college, mm -hmm. right? But even in a debased form, it's a gateway to discuss these deeper critiques of capital. And the sectarians might sit there and say, well, it was always going to fail. It's like, but you guys have been there since mm -hmm. like forever, and you've not managed to do make any inroads. And I think now we have an opportunity in a moment where we need to we need to move beyond Sanders and we need to really concentrate on things like 
organizing labor, uh, organizing a party. And also, you know, when we run, let, you know, maybe we're not ready to run a national campaign, but try and get more and more power on city and state levels mm -hmm. uh, to advance, you know, workers' interests. But, you know, like, again, I'm not a strategic, you know, a, a mm -hmm. strategist of the left, but it seems to me that I think it's time for us to make the hard emotional break from the Sanders era. Yeah, and like I was thinking, maybe we could get into a little bit of of sublation and some of the things you know the, the space that you're you're finding it fall into. But um, you know, I, I did also just want to note that while we have all of this too, um, it's important to also be wary of these kind of importations of you know liberalism um, into like our, our movement because I think people are like very very worried now. For example of like Hillary Clinton, you know, I'm with her style, like corporate neoliberal feminism, but there are new forms that are, are worrying. Like I, I get worried when I see the rise in popularity amongst people on the left of like degrowth, right? Which is mm -hmm. like an austerity based ideology, um, you know, best implemented by people like Emmanuel Macron, right? And I know the people who write it and argue for it are arguing for something very, very different, but I'm just noting that like, Capital will be very, very happy to acquiesce demands for less um, for the masses as ways to deal with um, with with climate. We have to be always, you know, watching for these kind of importations into our movement because I think, like, as we get inoculated against one form of, you know, general like liberalism, neoliberal politics, there's always more that are going to be popping up. Um, and I think continuing to do that, like political education work is, is crucial. And I mean, again, I love, uh, Bernie, I think, you know, what he's done has been very helpful, but it does uh, the one big criticism that I always, you know, throw his way is like, I do really wish he would have directed the movement, um, into organizations like the DSA, um, or, or functions like, you know, suggesting people read Jacobin and things like that, because there are a lot of people who are diehard Bernie fans who aren't, I think, fully incorporated into this like left socialist movement right now. And I think that like we, we need to find a way while we can uh, to get those people over here. Well, that yeah, that's I mean, that's the problem. You know, like one of the big arguments for rallying to the Sanders cause, even if you weren't 100 percent on board with the program was mm -hmm. that it would build the movement. But that has not happened in the way that it perhaps should have. And some of that blame lies with Sanders. It's not just our fault. It's also Sanders did not construct that movement. Mm -hmm. Sanders has been, uh, you know, uh, entered into the tent in the in the capacity that he, he, he can. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't use the, you know, there's a lot of like highly emotive language. He's betrayed us. He's like no. become a shit lib or whatever i wouldn't use that language i think he made a political calculation and decision uh, a harm reduction based one and you know one where he was like this is an opportunity mm -hmm. that i have to influence policy i think he took that opportunity uh but i think i think that was the wrong move i think his move should have been to mobilize his force outside of the parliamentary institutions but that's easy for me to say in hindsight given what we've known of the biden regime mm -hmm. And uh, given what we know of the state of the left. Well, frankly, um, <laughs> let's get to sublation. But I, I do just want to remind folks that a lot of people got all misty eyed um, early on in the Biden administration. A lot of people who I respect on the left thinking that this was going to be this kind of transformative. Oh, it wasn't the vehicle we wanted, but Biden maybe is going to, you know, import some of these ideas from the left. And as you've seen, he likes to pivot that way rhetorically from time to time. Um, but doesn't really show up. But um, I mean, I wanted to talk about a couple of these these articles um, directly. But before we get there, I mean, could you just let people know what sublation is, what the ideas are behind it, and what y'all are trying to publish and, and put out there? Sure. So sublation media is a media company. It comes out of the old Zero Books uh, editorial team. So last year, Zero Books was purchased by um, a new company and uh, they brought back the old team that had been there before Doug Lane, myself, C. Dagron, Ashley Frowley uh, uh, and Alfie Brown had been involved in it. There'd been another team. They brought back that old team and obviously we were no longer as part of that team. So we were like, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to not be publishers anymore? Are we going to, you know, mm -hmm. are we going to, are we going to, 
give up? You know, how, what are things going to do? Show, you know, Doug Lane was forced to give up his um, YouTube channel. And so we basically were kind of at a loss if we would continue the work, uh, as they say. And basically, we managed to get together some investors, people who appreciated the work that we'd done at Zero, And we set up a new media company uh, to start um, publishing books. And we've got a couple of books in the pipeline, including... Right. Norman Finkelstein's uh, sort of semi-autobiographical memoirs, which we're really excited to publish. Uh, we have a book by Todd McGowan, a well-known philosopher, Bülent Somay, a uh, Zizek translator in Turkey, and Stefan Bertram Lee, who, um, you know, he's he comes on TIR quite a lot. He's involved in sublation media. And he's a veteran of the Kurdish movement in Syria. And they're ma currently making a movie about him wow. with Conor Kilpatrick as the writer of the movie. Okay. So we started public. The idea was to start publishing books. But mm -hmm. obviously, because Doug Lane, who was the head of this enterprise, uh, you know, was well known for his YouTube channel. And, you know, as you probably remember, he published Michael's book and. You know, he published Ben Burgess's books as well and, you know, brought Ben in particular uh, onto his channel and other people onto his channel. Um, we thought, well, we'll do social media. But then one of the other ideas that we had was that maybe we could start our own online magazine. It's, you know, we didn't have much money mm -hmm. like uh, to do it, but we had a little bit in the budget to pay someone to make a website for us. And so we put together a team. Uh, Spencer Leonard uh, was the, uh, became the editor in chief. I became the managing editor. Ashley Frowley became the editor at large and Ashley Bound, uh, um, Alfie Bound became the deputy editor. And all of us have quite like different political orientations. So I would say kind of um, Spencer is definitely more of a kind of, uh, hardline Leninist, if you mm -hmm. were, if you were, whereas Ashley is very much like I believe the purest Marxist that you can find because, like, she always mm -hmm. reads Marx, like, uh, in very, like, very detailed and concentrated way. Um, very much kind of, uh, kind of, I don't know, like, she has like a kind of interesting politics, and Alfie is kind of more like me, kind of softy social democrat type uh and i guess i'm the softest social democrat type and so tough guy gene yeah well <laughs> it depends but the objective was the reason the, the objective was to have a magazine in which various tendencies of the left could write could be heard and could be di in dialogue with each other. Mm -hmm. Our chapters was not to publish things that we agreed with. We published things that nobody agreed with, but because it's a kind of position held by a significant proportion of people on the left, then we figured it should be published. So we don't stand by what we publish in the terms of having a line, <laughs> mm -hmm. but rather we want to have the broadest uh, uh, platform to represent a different ideological traditions also to bring in new writers people who wouldn't get you know published in more established journals and to publish you know people on the basis of what they're writing if they're saying something interesting or saying something that represents something uh, on the left in the hope that perhaps we can you know serve as a forum in which debate and discussion can take place uh mm -hmm. you know it hasn't always worked exactly how we wanted to we're still learning. We're still working out. We're still working out how to work together as a team. But the objective is to to use the term sublate, which means to both abolish but also to surpass and you know take something to a new level. Is you know we're we're trying to create a magazine that is not anti sectarian or anti you know a particular political line, but is non sectarian in the sense that we're quite happy for sectarian people to publish their opinions, but we want, we want to be open to every, mm -hmm. every different trend within the left. Because I think one of the issues perhaps in left media is that I do think 
most of the established uh, journals, which I think are very valuable and very important, they do over time develop a line. They develop a political line. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, we're not trying to replace a Jacobin, which mm -hmm. I think people may think this is unfair, but uh, I think I think it is actually fair to say that they are close to the DSA, right? You know, I would I say that fair, yeah. I, I think they're a pro DSA publication. Or you have a you know left liberal publication like um, Current Affairs, mm -hmm. or you have a more establishment uh, left um, publication like New Left Review, which is more academic. Mm -hmm. Our objective is to really try and avoid developing any type of political line and being this open forum for people to discuss and debate and to publish things that might not get published. Or, or, and to kind of try and get people in dialogue because they might see an article they like and then they see an article that they might disagree with or that might make them think in a different way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it takes... Uh, and because we are all of the members of the editorial board have, like, quite different ideological positions, um, it keeps us co incoherent to a certain degree, <laughs> but in a good way, I would say. I mean, I would say, like, on top of, like, people should definitely uh, be checking out the pieces that are in Sublation. I've, I have found a lot of them to be interesting, some of them to be enraging. Um, but what I do like about that is just going back um, to what we were talking about earlier about, like, contraction mm -hmm. within the left. I mean, it's nice to have a place where people can have that that dialogue um, and, and those conversations, those fights. One, you know, in the classic, like, free speech you know, argument where it's like it's good to have minority voices in there because they just might be correct. Um, but also too to sort of help, you know, fight against too much fragmentation where it's like, you know, if people are reading something similar, even if they disagree with it or being able to engage in a space, even if they disagree with things, you know, people are going to a similar place, if you get what I mean, instead of everyone just sort of running off into their own corners and just reading each other. It's I think it I, I think the plan is, is a good one. And uh, it's it's been very impressive so far. Well, thank you. I'm I'm I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad you're enjoying I'm, uh, things. And like I said, you know, there are going to be things that are published in that Pe people message me, and, and it's usually different people about different articles about like this article was trash, this article was good, uh, and that's fine, right? Like <laughs> some of the articles I think are like I really strongly disagree with. Mm -hmm. Some of them I think are a little, you know, uh, 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 but like you said, one of the problems with a lot of this new media is that we tend to bubble up mm -hmm. and we end up it, 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 in our particular uh you know bubbles not confronting or thinking about opinions and not engaging in good faith and i think the kind of underlying um basis of what we're trying to do at sublation is to try and engage in good faith mm -hmm. even if that's annoying right to some mm -hmm. you know even that if that can be annoying um I think engaging in good faith, engaging with people we disagree with, publishing people we disagree with, uh, 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 you know, putting forward arguments that we may or may not agree with. I think that's good. I think, I think we can occupy a space on the left that um, that I think is needed. And you know, people mock the free speech thing uh, a lot of the time because of the way that it's been instrumentalized by the political right. Mm -hmm. But um, free speech is a left-wing value. Totally. And it's a value, freedom is a value found in Marxism. You know, Marxism oh, yeah. going on, doesn't go on about equality all the time. It goes on about freedom and mm -hmm. human emancipation. And, you know, we want to have, we want to, you know, have an open debate that is not weighed down by left liberal moralism or sectarian, Stalinism, Trotskyism, you know, Maoism, but that where different people can engage with each other. It's not easy, but, uh, uh, you know, we'll do our best and we'll try. And I hope people will follow us on Twitter at Sublation uh, Mag. Uh, you can check out, we have a Facebook uh, page and uh, check out our site, which is www.sublationmag.com. Yeah, and I mean, I'll just say... Um... As a side note, um, you know, maybe about like Jackman, I, I do think sometimes people who might not have experience in publishing and magazine writing sometimes 
um, don't realize that you do oftentimes publish things that you might not necessarily agree with. Like Jacobin does this sometimes and like they'll get somebody from outside of the publication to write a piece and that's their opinion. And obviously, you know, the edit editors make decisions about what they publish, you know, all that kind of stuff. But it is always funny when people like put like the weight of the entire publication behind like one piece. One. But that's a whole, well, that's just like, that's just like a media literacy people, thing that I think sometimes on the left are bad at. And people, people love to hate on Jacobin. Yeah. People love to hate on Jacobin. They love to hate on Bashka uh, because a Jacobin was successful mm -hmm. uh, and Bashka was successful. And, you know, a lot of it, I think Jacobin, whether you agree with every article, Jacobin publishes a lot of good stuff and Jacobin, published a lot of important articles and you know whether you agree with the political direction of the journal in a general sense and i do think it has a political line or whether mm -hmm. you think uh, uh bashka's formula for advancing the left is the correct formula for advancing the left is right or wrong uh you know i think you can't take i think people should be you know i think people should appreciate jacobin for revivifying and mainstreaming to a mm -hmm. degree that they had not been left-wing uh, left wing publishing, and I hope Sebastian can be part of that. Um, uh, uh, ho hopefully, can be part of that. Well, let's let's take a peek at a couple of these articles if you're good on time. Um, yeah, because uh, there's a few. I want to start with this one because this is on a subject that I care about a lot. Um, this was a piece uh, by John McCollum uh, mm -hmm. called "Organizing Oil in uh, North Dakota," and. Um, I mean, rather than just sort of break down the entirety of, of the piece, I think that um, he makes some really strong arguments here. So he's talking about, you know, the question of organizing oil workers in the U.S., um, comparing that to some of the movements in the Americas. Um, but he makes this, this point that I think is a very important one here um, is that, uh, you know, there is a kind of ideology that is prevailing with oil workers in this country that is sort of hostile to union organizing in the sense that, like, you know, a lot of these people are single and they're most interested in just getting the biggest personal check uh, that they can. I would also add that talking to people here, um, one of the things that's also difficult is that it's so ingrained in the workforce here that oil is a, a boom and bust cycle. Mm -hmm. And like to be a part of the industry means accepting that and, you know, not complaining too much when you're on the other side of it. Um, but he, he makes this, this strong point that in this contraction that we're seeing in the, uh, um, in the movement right now, sorry, in the industry right now, there's a lot of opportunities for, you know, re energizing, uh, the union movement, um, in, in oil and gas, particularly in places like North Dakota, um, in Texas, um, he also adds, which I agree with, is that one of the <laughs> difficulties there, too, is that so much of the union movement has been tied uh, to a Democratic Party brand, which is very toxic, um, particularly in the areas where there's a lot of oil and gas production. I mean, I'm just curious if you have any general thoughts on that um, uh, that piece. And then I also I mean, I have some more things to say on it, too. Yeah, I thought it was an important piece because uh, John McCollum is a academic. Mm -hmm. uh, he's also a southerner. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, like he's from the heartland, uh, and he's a leftist who has done extensive interviews with these people, and I think he has an important perspective on them, uh, on things that I think a lot of people from outside make assumptions, and he's actually done the research, lived with these people, spoken to the people, you know, and has a profound respect for them as individuals and, and uh, you know, workers. I think he highlights an important thing that there is a contradiction between what the Democrats say, especially on the environment and what they do, which mm -hmm. undermines their position and that the brand makes uh, that there are material reasons why people might want to not want to join a union. And there are uh, political and cultural reasons why people might not want to join a union. So as you outlined before, obviously there's the young guys they want to get as much money as they uh, can in the short time frame, and the union is seen as uh, siphoning off that money. But then, there are, of course, unions in the article, he makes the point that many on the left, uh, many workers see unions as being fronts for the Democratic Party, mm -hmm. which uh, these workers see as hostile to their economic interests, to oil and gas, and hostile to their cultural values. Mm -hmm. So this makes it difficult for unions to organize. And his conclusion is, 
obviously uh, he thinks that unions should try and break the relationship with the Democratic Party uh, because it doesn't help unions organize. And which is an interesting argument. And like one thing I've been trying to cover a lot on the program is like what's happening in the oil and gas industry here in Texas, because um, I mean, I just I just always go back again to Bernie Sanders. Like I, I, I'm a supporter of the Green New Deal, um, particularly the just transition. Um, mm-hmm. But one tension that I've seen since that plan was launched in 2020 is that people sort of treat that as like, well, we've got the slogan and you know a program you can read somewhere and that that might replace the actual organizing work that needs to be done there and a lot of people even if they might like the idea of a just transition they don't believe it um particularly because they've experienced the at least here like the democratic party promising them a lot of stuff and never showing up you know even in the context of them just not winning power to be able to do it um, but eventually, you know, you start to get into those questions like, why do we endorse losers in, in races and sort of enrage, you know, the GOP <laughs> at us um, when we could maybe sit them out or maybe even, you know, get some favor with the with the ruling party here? Well, I think this is a really interesting point, And I think there are two interesting aspects to this. Firstly, I think there is a strong argument to be made that breaking the link with the Democratic Party, while there might be some perhaps administrative uh you know downsides to that that you know a republican party at a national level will have a more hostile national labor relations board mm-hmm. repo- appoint anti-union judges and those aren't small things on the flip side it could facilitate greater uh, recruitment and mobilization and build the concrete strength of labor as an independent force from the Democratic Party, which we all know is a capitalist party anyhow, Mm -hmm. right? The flip side of that is, though, does that mean we're going to move to a trade unionism rather than a socialism or social Mm -hmm. democracy? And, you know, at the end of the day, trade union consciousness amongst the workers is important for workers' rights, for workers' individuals, but that is not a sufficient level of consciousness and mobilization uh, to uh, bring about radical social transformation. So, you know, the question comes down is like, are we exchanging one form of bourgeois politics by tying ourselves to the Democratic Party with another form of bourgeois politics, with it, which is just having pure economistic trade union consciousness and focusing on bread and butter workers' issues to build power? And again, I don't know the answers to this, but I would probably at this juncture tend towards the idea that, you know, I think we do need to build labor power up as a force to be reckoned with. Totally. If that means breaking with the Democratic Party, uh, they will throw us as the they'll throw unions under the bus when it's convenient to them. So I don't see why unions do not throw the Democratic Party under the bus when it's convenient to them. And I think. Uh, I think that's what it means to build independent power. Because we always talk about building this independent power. Mm. But the question is, can we do it while we are so connected to a bourgeois political party like the Democratic Party? Does that mean that I don't think people should ever run on a Democratic line ever? No, I think that's silly because access to the ballot in America is you do it through political parties. If you could run through a Republican uh, ballot line as a socialist, I'd say do that too if there Mm -hmm. was a circumstance where that would make sense. Mm -hmm. But what I mean is linking yourself to the Democratic Party. If there's a Democrat who's going to like do what you want and you can hold them accountable. But what we've seen is we can't hold our people accountable. Mm -hmm. Vaughn points this out in his article that he published with Sublation. It's like Jamal Bowman showed us that we don't have a whip to whip down on those of our representatives who disobey the will of our party because we don't have a freaking party. DSA isn't a party, right? That's the fundamental problem. And, and like in, in that tent, in, in that example, like there's, there's a tension because like the problem that comes with Bowman is a problem actually of, of a bit of success, right? Where like the organization c- comes and then you get people into powerful offices with national profiles um, and then this organization isn't always the one whose phone calls are getting picked up first. 
um, mm-hmm. because, you know, you've shot people off into, you know, a political stratosphere that, you know, the interests that are coming to them oftentimes are more organized and more powerful. I will say in um, in DSA's, uh, you know, defense that that Bowman um, chapter really did uh, create an internal urgency to start to find ways um, to sort of force these organizations, the, sorry, membership and elected officials uh, to have like that stronger uh, relationship. And I know, for example, you know, Bowman has sort of been let, ha- has been let known that like, if he doesn't reform his position on Israel, Palestine, he won't be getting um, any more help or endorsements from the organization, right? Not perfect, but I'm just saying that like, it's not as if these criticisms are unknown within, within the organization itself. But beyond that, like, you know, one of the things like here in Texas is like, there is a protracted anti-union movement um, within the oil and gas industry. And it's been led by like ExxonMobil, for example, which locked out, um, you know, USW uh, workers for about 10 months to try to preempt a strike. And they they have a strategy right now in the oil and gas industry is using the moment of, of COVID where people did see threats, where they did see cuts as an argument for like, we need to turn this into a lean um, machine, basically. And you need to get rid of your union representation if you want to maintain having a job. Of course, it's a devil's bargain. But I know for people who care about union movements um, here and elsewhere, like these fights are happening. And sometimes I do see people on the left being actually very squeamish, apart from saying they support a just transition to actually showing up in support for people um, who work in, in that industry in general, right? Where I think right now, especially if you care about policies like the Green New Deal, climate change, like those are things we can't afford any losses. And we actually need to be seeing extreme growth to be able to build up the capacity to be able to challenge big, powerful corporations like ExxonMobil. And without a union movement, then it's just activists outside hoping that the Democratic Party will come up with a different tax breaks, um, you know, scheme, uh, you know, to encourage more solar and wind or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you know that's that's the fundamental problem is that you know we are we've just you know after five years six years of thinking we're gaining strength, mm-hmm. we've realized that how powerless we are to affect the political agenda, and it's extremely frustrating for people. No it's extremely frustrating, especially as things like the climate crisis. Uh, uh, marches on and I think you're right that's why people default to things like degrowth right Mm -hmm. that's why people uh, before on one hand they go to degrowth on the other hand they end up you know saying like well maybe if we have like a carbon trading and uh you know yeah solar panel individual solar panel things Mm -hmm. that will that will solve the problems when it will I need to be the center of attention for a second. No problem. <laughs> um, no, no, I think that that's, that's uh, very much on point. And like, yeah, I mean, these are the tensions and, mm-hmm. and the fights. And I think particularly in trying to win, because I don't know, maybe this is just hopeful. Maybe this is just like a little bit of nationalism that I have. I have but I've always felt that like one of the, the areas where we can do the most growth the quickest are actually in places like Texas, in places like the Dakotas, in places like the South, where like the Democratic Party brand is just so weak that the ability to build up organizations um, that stand up for workers um, like the opportunity is there because no one's filling in that gap. Like look at Alabama, for example, where, you know, the the, the coal miners at Warrior Met have been on strike for over a year now. And they've been supporting themselves through incredible amounts of solidarity. And they're highly activated on this Democratic Party, completely silent on this horrible um, moment where this, uh, you know, uh, where Warrior Met is basically trying to shut out these people who built up um, this organization to create immense amounts of value. But even the Republican Party um, doesn't show up. And it's not surprising because the Republican Party is very much a party of capital. But they have a, a, a very compelling story, right? Where Warrior Met was bought out by New York City Capitol. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah. and they're just like taking money from good old Alabama workers, right? And they're not showing up. The Democratic Party's not showing up. And obviously, I think a lot of people in those movements, like our friends at Value Labor Report, see that there's an opening there. Um, but, uh, you know, th- these are openings that we could really be taking advantage of. And what we have to yeah. be doing is building up the capacity to be able to fill in those gaps. But I think you could do that work actually quite quickly versus like some kind of like 
evolutionary like leftists who think that like basically in the south what we need to do is to create two generations of democratic party liberalism before we can start putting socialism on the ballot there oh my you know? god <laughs> which i That's... hate as an argument um we I actually think that we have a streamlined opportunity in a lot of those places to build up r rather quickly that's like a very degenerated form of like stagist, uh, <laughs> you know, like Stalinized Menshevik Marxism. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, like, I think, I think there will, there are, I think there are opportunities. The question is, can we see, can the left uh, reconstitute itself in a meaningful way and seize those opportunities? That's why, I mean, DSA has grown a lot, but it is a club right it's not a it's not a party right there is a huge disconnect between the national leadership and its orientation and like regional branches which op operate in very different ways from mm -hmm. one another that have very different ideological orientations so we don't have a strong disciplined movement we we um we can't intervene with workers we can't bring socialist consciousness to workers from without because we don't have the capacity or means to do it because even we don't know what we mean when we mm -hmm. say socialism. What are we asking for? Yeah. And those, that's not, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer on things. I'm just saying these are things that we should think about. That's what's in front of us. Yeah, that's what's in front of us. And it's okay to be worried about that. And But it's also, you know, try and be optimistic and think, these are problems that we can overcome and we can work out. I'm not smart enough to have any answers on this point, but I think to go back to sublation, one of the things we want to do at sublation is just be a forum where these like threads can be in one place where people can think for themselves and then, you know, work out, you know, work out what they think the most appropriate form of action is. Totally. Um, well, let, let me just, uh, I'm just going to do a quick uh, run through of folks of some suggestions of pieces that, you know, they should be reading. This is an excellent piece by Dwayne Monroe, who is, uh, by the way, a phenomenal Twitter follow and just all around uh, interesting and good guy. A really cool piece on AI, which I think really hits on some of the things Matt and I like to talk about on this program, which is like, you know, the techno futurist politics <laughs> projects a lot more than it has the capability for. And not only should we just be well versed in, you know, pushing back against that stuff, understanding what is the purpose of this. Um, and, and he makes a very important point here about you know, a lot of the AI stuff is meant to wage war on labor. Um, it's a really phenomenal piece there. And uh, we also have this piece, which I, I think we would honestly, if we wanted to get into it properly, would have to do a whole episode on it. But this is a phenomenal piece um, that was put out uh, by Sublation 2, a Russian Marxist perspective on current affairs. Um, it was put together by the 99 Zoo Eans uh, podcast. Forgive my uh, American pronunciation if I'm insulting our German friends there. But uh, they, they do a really interesting uh interview here with like Russian Marxists about the current state of politics in Russia, class composition in Russia, some really phenomenal analysis of the Ukraine uh, Russia conflict that I think has been sort of missing. And as I was saying to Gene before the show uh, went up, it was one of those pieces that was probably going to piss a lot of people off, both like the super rah rah pro Ukraine people and also this kind of weird movement in this country that treats Putin as if he's this like great defender of the soviet legacy <laughs> yeah i think period. this i think this one is one of the most important pieces we've published because it's a russian marxist perspective on mm -hmm. things and i think i think people should read it uh whether you agree with everything you know or not the point uh, the point is that it's definitely contradicts both the lab, left liberal and the stalinist uh mm -hmm. anti slash anti-imperialist uh, narratives about the Russia Ukraine war and you know has a very nuanced and important an analysis. Yeah, and as uh, do most things in sublation, and people can uh, find that at sublation. And you've Mag been in sublation, I have, man. I really love writing that piece I wrote about Greg Abbott and how he's been using COVID 19 to <laughs> gain tremendous amounts of power. And I hope to be able to write for y'all again sometime in the future. We'll see uh, what comes across the desk. Yeah, definitely. Well, you maybe one day I was time. thinking I never got around to it, and it might be peon time. Maybe we should talk about this off air. But I've always wanted to do something investigating what populism was, um, because that was our 
there's a dominant moment for like 10 years and it feels like a lot of that has fallen away yeah i think the memory has been erased there was a great <laughs> uh there's a great scholar out there anton jaeger who's yes who's anton jaeger is like amazing yeah he's the guy to talk to about that he wrote a piece um <laughs> just giving people suggestions for damage magazine another one um like the first or second week of the COVID 19 pandemic uh yeah. which i thought was one of the best analysis of what was coming. And I think he got a decent amount of it correct, which is, which says a lot about, you know, nobody knew what was going on in that moment, but um, he definitely saw some of the, the movements that capital was going and some of the crisis of, of populism. Yeah. I can't suggest to Anton Yeager's work enough. Yeah, definitely. I hope to get him in our magazine soon too. Oh, that'd be amazing. Well, everybody, it's Gene Bajelon. You know him from This Is Revolution podcast. If you're lucky enough to go to Missouri State University, try to sit in on a class with him. Um, and also managing editor at Sublation Magazine. And it's always great to have you on the program. Hey, it's great to speak to you, David. It's been wonderful and really enjoyable. And uh, I hope we can do this again soon sometime. Absolutely. Let's make a habit of it. 